In the previous lecture, I gave a detailed explanation of Ptolemy's epicycles. Over the centuries, mathematicians in various cultures had to make Ptolemy's epicycles increasingly mathematically complicated in order to fit the appearances that we see in the sky with respect to planetary motion. By the time of the 15th and into the 16th centuries, Ptolemy's model of epicycles was so complicated that even in Europe, people were beginning to challenge its validity. And we now get to a very important figure in this history, and that's Nicholas Copernicus. That was actually, by the way, not his real name. His real name was Nikolai Kopernik. He was Polish, but for whatever reason, we have since Latinized his name to be Nicholas Copernicus. Copernicus was educated by the Catholic Church. He actually obtained a doctorate in what is called canon law. At the same time, however, he was a mathematician and an astronomer. And he looks at Ptolemy's model of epicycles, and he basically says, this is too complicated. There has to be a much simpler explanation for planetary motion. And he then hypothesizes or proposes what is called the heliocentric theory of the universe. When I say universe here, by the way, I also mean it in the same context of what we now think of today as a solar system. In the heliocentric universe, as hypothesized by Copernicus, the sun is at the center of the solar system, and then all the planets, including the Earth, orbit the sun. Okay, so now we're in the early 16th century. And we have Nicholas Copernicus and he proposes the heliocentric or sun-centered theory of the universe. Copernicus assumes that the Sun is the center of the solar system and all the planets, including the Earth, orbit the Sun. Universe and all the planets. including the Earth, orbit the Sun. Like everyone who preceded him, however, Copernicus also assumed that the planetary orbits were perfectly circular in nature. In this case, however, they were centered on the Sun. Orbits perfectly circular. And then he also made the following assumption. He didn't have a physical reason for this. This didn't come until later. Instead, his assumption just fits what we see in the sky with respect to his model. But basically, Copernicus assumes the following. The closer a planet is to the sun, the faster it moves in its orbit. Sun, the faster it moves in its orbit. Okay, if you make these assumptions about the solar system, this then leads you to the following picture. This picture is the basic layout of the solar system. Okay, so now we have the Sun as the center of the solar system, like so. And then the planet that is closest to the Sun because it moves fastest in its orbit is the planet Mercury. Okay, and then after that we have the planet Venus. Okay, and then after that, correctly, Copernicus places the Earth. Okay, we'll see why he does that as we proceed. But let's say, for example, that right here is the Earth. Let me go ahead and draw on the night side of the Earth like so. And then here's the day side. Okay, we also have, however, the moon, of course. The moon is still orbiting the Earth because it's the only way to explain the lunar phases. 
So let's say, for example, right here, move the moon. Okay, and then after that, correctly, we have Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Okay, and now with just this simple picture, with no mathematics whatsoever, we'll get to the math of Copernicus in the next lecture, but just from this simple picture, immediately this picture explains away the problems of planetary motion that Ptolemy and his successors were struggling to explain through epicycle theory. So for example, the first problem involving Mercury and Venus. Recall that you're never gonna see Mercury or Venus in the middle of the night. You're only gonna see those two planets near twilight hours. This simple picture easily explains that. For example, let's say you're standing here on the Earth. Let me label it as such, by the way, like so. And you're standing at that point right there. If you're standing at that point, your local time pretty obviously is midnight. So for example, regardless of where Mercury is in its orbit, regardless of where Venus is in its orbit, are you ever gonna be able to see either of those two planets at midnight? No, it immediately explains away that problem. It also explains away the problem of retrograde motion in the following manner. This is difficult to draw, so I'm not gonna do so. Instead, I'm gonna prompt you in just a few minutes to watch a screencast. But before I do, with respect to retrograde motion, the following occurs. Let's once again use the example of Mars. This is, by the way, in part Copernicus's motivation for correctly placing the Earth here in between Venus and Mars. In the case of Mars, approximately once every two years or so, we go by Mars, we lap Mars. And then over the course of several weeks while that process is occurring, from our vantage point on a moving platform, we then see Mars undergo retrograde motion against the background stars. Begin to think of it in the following way. Let's say, for example, that my right hand here is Mars and my left hand here is the Earth. Okay, now the Earth is closer to the Sun than Mars is. So then therefore, by assumption, according to Copernicus, Earth is then therefore moving faster in its orbit. So approximately once every two years, we basically go by Mars. The following happens, like so. And then from our vantage point on a moving platform, we then see the retrograde motion of Mars against the more distant background stars. This is difficult to draw, so I'm not gonna to bother to do so. Instead, what I want you to do at this point is pause this lecture and then watch the screencast that I've titled for you, Retrograde Motion Heliocentric Model. So go ahead and pause this lecture and now watch that screencast. Okay, very good. Now that you've seen that screencast, once again, with no mathematics whatsoever, we have now explained away retrograde motion by using here the heliocentric model of the universe. So Copernicus's idea is immediately very elegant because it immediately explains away the problems associated with planetary motion that Ptolemy was struggling to explain with epicycles and blah, blah, blah. We'll get to the mathematics, however, of Copernicus in just a little while. Before I do, however, being educated by the Catholic Church, Copernicus knows full well, for example, that what he is proposing here is heresy. It goes against the official teachings of the Catholic Church. So then therefore, how does Copernicus basically avoid being excommunicated or even perhaps being executed? Well, he kind of plays it smart. First of all, he did most of his work on the heliocentric model of the universe when he was a relatively young man. However, he waited until basically he was in his 80s, more or less on his deathbed, if you will, before he actually finally published his work. So by the time that this book was published and it was disseminated throughout Europe, he had already died, he had been given the last rites, he was already in heaven and blah, blah, blah. And then secondly, a younger assistant to Copernicus, a guy named Andrew Osiander, wrote a preface to the book. And the preface to the book basically says two things. The first line of the book is a dedication to the Pope. So whoever the Pope was at that moment, they dedicated the book immediately to that person. And then secondly, basically the remainder of the preface says essentially the following. It says, don't take this too seriously. Just think of this as an interesting mathematical exercise and nothing more. However, it's very obvious that Copernicus himself did not feel that way. It's very obvious now in retrospect that he firmly believed that his idea was correct 
And we know that because of the depth of the mathematical detail that he then went through in getting the basic layout of the solar system correct. I'll go through that in part two of this lecture on Copernicus.